Amen. Amen. All right. We started last week talking about the high priest garments. And uh, many of you know that uh, some of the greatest secrets, and there really are, they're secrets of the new covenant are in the scriptures in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a lot of detail about stories of people, uh, places, things. However, there's nothing insignificant that's in the scriptures. Every seemingly insignificant detail is actually a hidden typology, a shadow, a truth about new covenant truths, new covenant uh, truths of Jesus. It's all in the scriptures. Um, what many believers don't, don't um, embrace is that when you got saved, God has provided every single thing you'll ever need in your entire life. He's already thought about your wealth. He's already provided for that. He's provided for your health. And the whole thing, all the package, though, is all received by faith. You have to step out on faith and take it. Are y'all with me? And so uh, one of the keys, though, to doing that is understanding what the benefits are. Understanding what the benefits are. And again, the benefits aren't, don't just, uh, the, the truths of the benefits aren't just sitting on the surface. You have to dig and get them because just like anything in life, um, you have to pursue it if you really want it. And, and the pursuit is what separates the, the men from the boys, the women from the girls. And most people are so casual about the things they want, they go through life broke down and busted and disgusted. And, and if you never really get hungry for these things and get, and, and, and get, really, uh, get some tenacity about you to receive them, you may, you, may, you may never receive them. But it's just like anything else. You just can't be an Olympic athlete just by, by doing average things. Isn't that right? Come on, y'all. Yeah. You aren't going to be a great success in life unless you really want to be. And you're willing to go after it and get it all. And likewise are the things of God. Likewise, they're the same way. You have to be hungry for it and really want it and say, this is important to me. This is more important to me than watching Andy Griffith. It's more important for me to get these truths of the scriptures than just sitting at home and sleeping. And, and, and so for most people, why the pool of average is so large is because most people are just unwilling to pay that price. Most people are unwilling to dig. Un most people are unwilling to do above what average people do. And so if you don't do above that, you'll get what average people get. But I know I'm talking to a people that want more than, than just barely getting by since Jesus paid such a great price. You want it all. And I believe I'm looking at winners and victorious people that won't settle for anything less than God's absolute best. I'm in the right place. Am I in the right place? All right, grab your Bible. Turn it open to uh, Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to bring out our high priest. Not yet. Not yet. In just a couple seconds, I want to share with you just one scripture, uh, one little passage of scripture. The, um, the, there's two whole entire chapters exclusively about the high priest garments. There's one entire chapter in the entire Bible about the creation of the entire universe. One chapter, but there's two chapters detailing the clothes of the high priest. Doesn't that seem weighted a little wrong? Because the world spends so much time studying the earth and studying stuff. Uh, but then the Bible spends a whole lot of time on stuff that, uh, that most people would think are insignificant. And the truth of the matter is they're not insignificant. They're truths about who Jesus is to you. And the more you understand him, the more you begin to uh, get a revelation of him, the higher your life will be elevated. Why? Because of the greater trust that you'll have in him. Most people don't tithe and give for one main reason. They don't trust God. Yeah. Okay, all right, we're on Wednesday night Bible study so I can talk straight to y'all. Yeah. All right, can I talk straight to you? Yeah. And, uh, and if you don't trust God, even if he loves you, think about this. If there was someone who uh, had the, the um, wherewithal financially or resources, whatever was necessary, to bail you out of situations, but you didn't think they cared about you. Even though they had the resources and really did, but if you didn't know that they did, you would never, you would never lean on them for that resource. And that's the, that's the way it is with the things of God. If you know that he's for you, if you know that, he, that you're more precious to him than anything, in all of creation, uh, then you would be more apt to step out in faith and go for what's rightfully yours. What keeps people in fear is a lack of trust. What keeps them not stepping out and going after it and just go, stepping out on the water, so to speak, is not trusting. Are you with me? And so that's why these things are in the scriptures, so that you uh, understand the heart of God and trust him. Are y'all ready to get into it? All right, here, turn to Hebrews chapter 7 first. Hebrews chapter 7. This whole chapter in, in Hebrews is dedicated to the high priest. 
This whole chapter, all, the whole book of Hebrews, one of my favorite books in the New Testament, is the book of Hebrews. Why? The book of Hebrews is a, is a comparison and contrast by uh, probably the greatest, well, not even probably, the, the person who had the most revelation about the, uh, about the things of God that's ever lived on the earth outside of Jesus is Paul. Paul wrote three quarters of the New Testament, and he was a Hebrew. The Bible says he was taught by this teacher named Gamiel, who was, an, uh, you know, who was a Pharisee uh, uh, and who was an expert in the things of the law. And so Paul says he was taught by him. He, he gives all his credentials and, and begins to explain why he, uh, why he is an authority to teach these types of things. He was a Pharisee himself, and so the book of Hebrews is written to who? Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody could have said in, in, in unison, who's the book of Hebrews written to? Thank you. Thank you. Be with, say it with some confidence. It's written to the Hebrews, but it's for the whole body of Christ. Written to the Hebrews by a Pharisee who understood the law. And so what he does is just compare to the, to the Hebrews, the old covenant Levitical order priesthood to the new covenant uh, Melchizedek order priesthood. So he does a comparison and contrast. And so I just want to share a little bit of that with you right here in these verses. Then we'll bring out our high priest. High priest. Whole chapter 7 dedicated to explaining the high priest. He says, look, therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people receive the law Hold up. therefore if perfection were through the levitical priesthood he's implying here that perfection in god's eyes is critically important but it could not be attained through the levitical priesthood but in contrast perfection you you being perfect in the eyes of god is accomplished through the melchizedek priesthood in God's eyes, God looks at you and sees you perfect in his sight. See, I can see y'all don't get that. That's huge. God looks at you and sees no sin. He so sees no Im imperfections. He sees you perfect. If you've got children, you understand this. This is like coming home with a perfect A report card, perfect obedience, perfect attendance. Per this person does everything perfectly right in God's eyes. He's talking about you. What that does is put you in a position of favor. You've got righteousness and right standing with God that everything you do, he says, I'll cause favor to come upon you. Yeah. Why aren't y'all taking advantage of that then? Why? Because it's by faith. You've got to understand that and believe it. All right. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priesthood? Uh, priests should, what need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek uh, and, not be, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Who was the first high priest in the Bible? Aaron. Aaron is who? Brother of Moses, big brother of Moses. So when you hear me say something like the Aaronic priesthood, what I'm talking about is Aaron and, the, and, and it was after the order of Aaron. Aaron and his sons, the Levites. Levites, all right. Um, all right, okay. So hit the next verse for me. For the priesthood being changed, the old order of priesthood, Levitical order, Aaronic priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Now, here's what, here's what he's saying. The old order of priesthood under Aaron the, and the Levites, since it, for the priesthood being changed, of necessity, there's also a change of law. The law changed because there's a new priesthood now. Watch, hit the next one for me, please. Or verse 17. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come uh, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment. The old order priesthood was according to keeping the commandment. Yeah. All right? And the new order, oh, watch this. But according to the, let me see, who has come not according to the law of a flesh and commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. The new order of priesthood is according to a, the power of an endless life. What, whose life is it talking about? Jesus, the whole new order of priesthood, because remember what we explained last week, as the, pe as the priesthood is, so are the people. If the high priest is perfect and the people are imperfect, how does God view the people? Perfect. However, the priesthood is, watch this, if the people
people are perfect, yet the high priest is imperfect, full of sin, jacked up. How does God treat the people? He treats them jacked up because the high priest is jacked up. As the high priest is, so go the people. All right. So now he says the, the old priesthood was according to a fleshly law. The new priesthood, though, is according to the power of an endless life, his life. Everything now that, that is for the people of God is because of the high priest that we have. If he's sick, you're sick. He's not sick. He has this endless, abundant life. Guess what you get? Everything he has and is, you are. As Christ is, so are we in this world. As he is right now, so are you. You got to get stirred up about that and, and be willing to fight for that. You get what I'm saying? Fight by faith for that. Uh-uh, I'm not going to settle for sickness. I'm not going to settle for poverty. That's not what I'm supposed to have. All right, are y'all with me? Stir my own self up. I'm going to fight somebody right now. Good gracious, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, hit the next one for me, please. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Who's saying that? God the Father is saying that to Jesus. It's recorded four times in the Bible. A couple times in Hebrews, a couple times in the Psalms. God tells Jesus, there's a whole passage that said where the Father is having a conversation with the precarnate Jesus. Amazing where he's saying, I, uh, I'm sending you to the earth to sacrifice your body. You're going to be a high priest forever. Why is that important? Because the high priest of the flesh had weaknesses and faults. If they had weaknesses and faults, God treated the people as if they had weaknesses and faults. Now we have this perfect high priest who is Jesus forever. Y'all get it? For on the one hand, there is an, anno an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. All right. For the law made nothing perfect. You get what he's implying here, but this new high priest does. Amen. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we do what to God? Draw near. Under the law, it's, it separated men from God. You know that everybody just couldn't go to church back in the, in the, couldn't go and have fellowship, close fellowship with God. Only one person could. The high priest. Who could go behind the, the holy of holies, the, the veil? Only one person under the old covenant. The high priest. And he had to do it with certain clothing on. He had to do it and make a sacrifice for sin, make a sacrifice for his own sin first, and then for all the people. And they had to have a rope tied to his foot in case he fell down dead. The old covenant of law separates you from God. The new covenant, you remember what happened when Jesus hung on the cross and said it is finished? The, the, the uh, veil in the temple rent. It ripped wide open. Why? Because it says now everybody has access to the Holy of Holies because of Jesus. God, that's good news. And that's why the Bible, we read it last week in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14 says, Therefore, come boldly before the throne of, seeing that we have, turn, turn over there, uh, Hebrews 4 and 14. Seeing then that we have such a great high priest or something like that. Is that it? Uh, 4, 14, Hebrews 14, something like that. Yes, yes, that's it, baby. When you, when you read it, read it like a, sing then, we have. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sing then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. He's saying, don't you let go of what he's purchased. Hold fast to your confession. Why? It's coming to pass. Yeah. Oh, don't miss Sunday. Don't miss Sunday. I got a message for you that is going to stir you up and, and, and help you when it, in times of fainting. Amen. When you want to drop off. Amen. All right. Did y'all see that? Singing, we have a great happy. Okay. All right. Now. All right. Let's welcome our high priest. Somebody make some noise for the high priest. Ladies and gentlemen, the high priest. Look at the high priest. Come on, come on, make some more noise for the high priest. <laughs> yes, wave at, the, at, at everyone, high priest. Bless the people, bless the people. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, Akasha Gagabama. Now watch this. Do you know the interesting thing about the book of Luke? The book, the book of Luke starts out with a dumb high priest. Do you know who he is? A dumb priest. You remember who it was? Zachariah. It was, it was John the Baptist's father. He can't talk. It ends with Jesus 
being, uh, being uh, what do you call that? Ascending, blessing the people. It's just showing, okay, praise the Lord. All right. How you doing, high priest? You doing good today? All right, all right. Well, let's, uh, let, me, let me just recap a couple things for you, and then we're just going to jump right into the clothing, all right? Um, all of the clothing, all of the clothing of the high priest is made of what? Linen. linen. Yes, yes. Why is it made of linen? Yes. Ezekiel 44. Can y'all put that passage up here for me? Yes. Make some noise for the people in the back. Good God. Watch this. But the priest, now keep in mind, as you read through the Old Testament, it's just chapter after chapter, detail about priests and did this and all, the, all this stuff. Why, is the, why does the Bible make all this, the, do, t- tell all these stories about priests and high priests and the priesthood? What is that all about? Here's why, why it is. The Bible says that you are a royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. So what is all that? All those Old Testament stories are really typology about us. It's secrets, it's truths about who we are and what we have, what's been purchased for us. Watch this. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, what does Zadok mean? Melchizedek. Zadok means righteousness. (laughs) Righteousness. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of righteousness. We're the sons of righteousness. Come on, somebody. Who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, and that they come near to me, near me to minister to me, that they shall stand before me and to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. All that's significant. All that's significant. It means something. They shall enter my sanctuary and they shall come near my table to minister to me and they shall keep my charge. And it shall be whenever they enter the gates of the inner court, that's in the tabernacle, right? In the temple, tabernacle of Moses, in the inner court that they shall put on linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister within the gates, within the inner court, or within the house. Why? Verse 18, they shall have linen turbans, linen turbans. Why does God want them to have linen turbans? Cool head, cool heads. And he goes on to describe in Exodus 39, uh, yeah, Exodus 39, underwear, cool trousers. Get it what he's saying? Cool, cool minds, cool and cool this down. Come on, somebody. Are y'all listening to me? Come on, don't, don't, you know it's true. It starts up here. You got to get your thoughts cooled down and that'll help cool all this all that down. Wow. Hey, yeah. All right. They shall, they shall not clothe themselves with, oh, they shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen trousers, that's underwear, on their bodies. They shall not clothe themselves at any, with anything that causes, why? Why sweat? Where is sweat first mentioned in the Bible? That's it, baby. Yes. You shall work by the sweat of your brow. Genesis chapter three, after the fall of man. Sweat came in. Now watch, I'm sweating right now. That's not what the Bible's talking about. What the Bible's talking about is, is a grind that is, um, in, in fact, after, man's, after Adam and Eve sinned, after they ate of the fruit, the earth stopped producing easily. They had to work really hard from the sweat of their brow to, pr- to cause the earth to produce. You're no longer under that curse as a Levite. No, no. So you just have to. Okay. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? Okay. Isn't that a good benefit? Okay. All right. All right. Now, uh, so all the clothing is made of linen. Everything has a linen base. And then the Bible always mentions um, gold. That there's gold. And in Exodus chapter 39, it describes, you don't have to turn there, but those two, the the 28 and 39 are the two chapters that describe the high priest's clothing. What they did was take literal gold, press it down, melt it down and press it into flat sheets. And then they cut pieces of thread of the gold. So the gold in the clothing is literal gold. (laughs) Not this clothing. We already talked about that. No need to panic. Don't have to break in the church to steal anything. This is all fake replica so don't panic all right but everything all gold gold represents what in the bible deity, deity and divine divine righteousness divine righteousness is important because many people think that we have to 
create our own righteousness. The Bible says, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness is divine righteousness. His righteousness. So gold always represents deity and divine righteousness. Silver always represents what? Redemption, right? Bronze always represents what? Judgment. We're going to do a study on the tabernacle, all that stuff too, not tonight. But, but so that we understand what happened, the more you get these things, the more you'll know how much Jesus loves you, the more you'll be able to receive these things. Now, last week we talked about this ephod. This is the linen ephod. The linen ephod is made of linen, but then it's made of three other colors of thread. Number one is blue. Blue represents what? Grace, Grace and heaven. Grace and heaven. The, uh, then the, and another color is scarlet or red. Red represents what? Man. man, blood. The word Adam in the Hebrew means red man. Red, red man. Red man of dirt. Red represents man. Blue represents heaven and God. Red represents man. The other color that's always mentioned is purple. Do you remember in elementary school when they'd have you mix colors together? What happens when you mix blue of heaven, God, with the red of man? What color do you get? Purple, which is the third color that's always mentioned. Why? Because God mixed with man equals royalty. All right? And so royalty is who we are. We are a royal priesthood. That's who we are. And that's why these colors, all that stuff is significant. You'll see those same colors throughout the entire Bible. All right. Same colors always listed. All right. Then, uh, so the, those are the colors and gold, the gold in here again stands for deity. Now, last week we talked about these two stones. There's two onyx stones that are placed on the shoulders on the onyx stones. The Bible calls them stones of fire. Onyx stones are, they, they have the names of the children of Israel engraved on the, on these onyx stones, six on this side, six on this side, listed in the order of their birth, right? From youngest to oldest, six listed on this side. Why on the shoulders? Why in stone? Why engraved? Engraved because it's showing us that you're resting in Christ's strength and power. The shoulders represent power and strength. Your name is engraved in stones and it's resting on Christ's strength, his power. You have, be strong in the power of his might. You're resting in his strength. Are you with me? But then we went on and we started going through. The the next thing described in that chapter 28 is these gold strands here. They call them twisted and golded, uh, twisted and braided gold. So what they did with those strands of, 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 uh, of like, uh, really just strands of gold. They would twist them and then braid them together to create chains. They put a, here, let's read it. Uh, yeah, well, let's look at this passage real quick because I get it, get it at the end. This, these gold strands, these gold chains, the Bible calls them, chains these, the, the uh, what is this thing called? The breastplate to the, stra- the, the uh, shoulder, shoulder stones. It's chained to them with gold. So there's a connection between the strength of God and the heart of God. All right? And so let let me get to that. But these chains are very significant. Look what God's in Hosea 11 and 4. It says, I drew them with gentle cords. These gentle cords is the same word in the Hebrew for that braided and stranded gold. I drew them with gentle cords with bands of love. He calls these bands of love. And I was to to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped down and fed them. What is God saying? He's saying, I with this golden chain. What does the gold represent? Deity. Deity and divine Yeah, don't forget that part. Deity and divine righteousness. So God is saying, I change you, change you to my love with divine righteousness and deity. You're chained to God. There's no escaping. You can't backslide into hell. You can't send your way into hell once you get saved. You're chained to him. 
All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, now, okay, uh, what else did we get? We didn't we get that far. Now let's go, let's go turn in your Bible to Exodus. Y'all ready? Let's do it now. All right, move forward. By the way, he said, I put these, your names in that stone as a mem- memorial. And again, we were, just a reminder, he, he does that. So as, just the same way you put pictures of your kids and your loved ones on your iPhone or on your or pictures around. You don't do it because you'll forget them. You do it because you love them. You like looking at Anybody do it like me and Shanae? We sit there and look at the pictures of our kids. Come on, Andy, raise your hand. I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> sit there and look at the Daddy, do you do that? You look at my picture all the time? Do you really, Daddy? You love me. <laughs> that's my man right there. I love him. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. What a blessing. All right. So, so that's what that's all about. Whenever you see memorial, it's God saying, I love you. This is like a picture of you to me. I remind, remind, it's a, mem- it's, it's a, it warms my heart to look on my shoulders and see that you're engraved in my, sh- in my strength. All right. All right. Now turn over in your Bible t- to, uh, we're in Exodus 28 and verse 15. Are y'all ready? Now I've got a piece of revelation for you tonight. That's going to blow you away. It's going to blow you away. You're going to love this. You ready? (laughs) Oh, my God. This is awesome. All right, ready? Here we go. Verse 15. You shall make the breastplate of judgment. Now, isn't this interesting? It calls this breastplate a breastplate of judgment. But here's the good news. This breastplate is, here, let's just read. He'll describe what it is. Artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. He said it's made of the same stuff that the ephod is made of. You shall make it of gold, which stands for deity and divine divine righteousness. Blue, God. Purple, the combination of royalty and man, right? God and man, royalty. And scarlet, which is red. And fine linen, wool linen, right? We talked about the the, uh, uh, woven linen. Linen always represents... Pure, Jesus being pure man, perfect man. All right, uh, and you shall make it. Next. It shall be doubled into a square. This breastplate, that's why we got it doubled right there. See it doubled? Into a square. A span uh, shall be its length and a span shall be its width. Perfectly square. And you shall put settings of stones in it. And, uh, four rows, bam, 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 Right? The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, an emerald. This shall be the first row, okay? Bam, 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 bam. And uh, let's see, the second row shall be turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row shall be a jacinth, an agate, and a, and whatever that word is. And the fourth row shall be a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. And they shall be set, these precious stones shall be set in gold. Now Watch. Ooh, this is good news for you. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, 12 according to their names. Now, again, we as the body of Christ, the typology of the children of Israel is a picture of the body of Christ. What has God done? He's saying each of you are individually jewels. Each of you different jewels. Your name is engraved. It's not written, can't be erased for any reason. It's engraved in these jewels. You're each individual jewels and you're set in divine righteousness. Here's what it's saying. On this breastplate of righteousness, the Bible in the Old Testament calls it the breastplate of judgment. What that means is you've been judged as righteous. You've already been judged. Your judgment is you're righteous. And not only are you righteous, you're an individual precious jewel on God's heart. He has his, your name engraved as a jewel on his heart. Amen. You're more precious to God than anything. Watch this. He goes on. It gets better. The soldiers have the names of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name, and it shall be according to the 12 tribes. Next. You shall make chains for the breastplate at the end. Okay, so he's saying put some chains on this thing. Uh, Then like braided cords of pure gold. Here again, this, this, this gold strands that he's talking about, that chains of love, the Bible calls them. You shall make two rings for the breastplate. Here they are, these two rings right here. Aren't we good, man? Give it up for Angela Stewart. She made all this for us. Rings of gold, now again, real gold is what, the, is what the Bible is talking about, not these. And you shall make rings of gold for the breastplate. What does a ring represent? Covenant, marriage. God's saying, you know, put rings of covenant of marriage on this breastplate. Why? Because I'm married to you. Right? 
He says, uh, uh, and you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate and put the two rings on the ends of the breastplate, like we did. Next. Then you shall put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings, which are on the ends of the breastplate, and the other two ends of the braided chains, you shall fasten them to the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps. Chain with this divine righteousness and my deity, chain you, you're, in my, you're, you're engraved on my heart as a jewel, but chain that to my strength. What is this saying? This is saying the more you understand that you're precious to God's heart, you're a jewel in his heart, that's what chains you to his strength. The more you understand how much God loves you, the more you'll walk in his strength. Mm. Watch this. It gets better. The other two ends of the brain, you to fasten to the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. Next, please. You shall make two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate on the edge of it, which is on the inner side of the ephod. That's why I'm there in the back. Make some more noise for Angie. Is that Angie out there? I think I see you, Angie. Woo, make some noise. Make, make some noise for Angie. Awesome, Angie. Uh, two other ends you should make and put them on the shoulder straps underneath the ephod toward the front, right at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod, right? They shall bind the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod using a blue cord. Watch what he says. He says, uh, using a blue cord so that it is above the intricately woven band of the ephod so that the breastplate does not come loose. Tie a blue strand. Why blue? Grace. Attach this ephod breastplate to the ephod with my grace. Connect you to my heart with grace. Come on, high priest. That's good. <laughs> Using a blue cord so that it's above the intricately woven band of the ephod so that the breastplate does not come loose from the ephod. Next. So Aaron, who is Aaron a picture of? He's a, he is the high priest. He's a picture of Jesus under the new covenant. Watch this. Let's read it like that. So Jesus shall bear the names of the sons of God on the breastplate of judgment over his heart. <laughs> when he goes into the holy place, where's Jesus? Seated at the right hand of the Father. He's there in heaven, in the holy place, as a memorial before the Lord continually. You're on his heart. Watch this. Here's the Father. It'd be nice if I had another chair. The Remember, where is Jesus? Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. What does the Bible describe God as? Two things it describes him as in the book of John, the epistle of John. One as God is love and God is light. All right. So now here's the father. The father is here and he is love and light, right? God is love and God is light. When, thank you so much. When Jesus is right here next to the father, we're these jewels. What happens when when, if Jesus turns over here, these jewels, what happens now with all this light that shines on you? It causes you to glisten and gleam. Have you ever been to the diamond store, the jewelry store, and you want to buy an engagement ring? What do they do? They put it on, they put this diamond on a dark background and then shine some light on it, right? Why? Because it begins to show its beauty. Whose beauty are you showing? You're showing God, Jesus' beauty. But you're engraved on his heart. You're chained to his strength. And the greater revelation that you get of his love, the greater you walk in his strength. Now, are y'all ready? Y'all got that part? Make some noise. Isn't that good news? Continually before the Lord. Okay, okay. Now, let's read on. Read on. Get to the next one. Is that, did I skip the... Yeah, go ahead. Read the next one. Exodus 28, hang on here, y'all. Uh, lights and chains. Oh, 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 where's the umen and the thurman and all that? Oh, yeah, this is it. Verse 30. This is the one. And you shall put, this is the part I've been wanting to get y'all to, and we're almost done. We're almost done. Isn't this good? Now, this is going to take me three hours right here, but we just watch. <laughs> I'm only going to teach this one verse right here. <laughs> I'm just kidding, by the way. And you shall put 
in the breastplate, again, remember, under the new covenant, this is called the breastplate of righteousness. Sit up straight there, uh, high priest. Praise the Lord. I know it's hot up here. Praise the Lord. You need some water up here, high priest? You sure you're good? Living water will make you breathe. Uh, let's, uh, heal. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, okay, watch this. And put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thumen. Tumen, some people, I guess. Thumen or Tumen, whatever it is. All right, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. All right, what is this Urim and Tumen? These are, uh, uh, where's, my, where's my cool light back here? So I can point these words out to you. The, the, uh, in the Hebrew, the, the uh, I am is like our S. Ooh, I hear my iPod in there playing. Can you turn that off for me? End of thanks. Um, uh-oh, did I kill my battery? Good gracious Jesus. I did. All right, do you see the word uh, Urim? I am means plural. It's like the S in the Hebrew, right? Ur means Lights, light. You are light. I mean, you are means light. Ur means light. I am on the end makes it lights. Tumen, tum means perfect. All right? Tumen means perfections. So put inside of the breastplate, what? Lights and perfections. You are, who is the light of the world? Who are the lights of the world? Yes. He is the perfect high priest. We are the perfections of the earth. All right, now watch this. All because of him, not because of your doings. All right, but watch what this does. Watch what happens here. And they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. Now, all right, okay. Now, let me show you about this Urim and Tum because there's, here's the secret I want you to know about this. This is this, this Urim, Urim, the U and the T-H. Let me say that because it's hard saying those words for me. Those are something that even today scholars, biblical uh, you know, theologists, they don't understand exactly what this is. Some say they put some kind of substance inside of this, substance inside of this, but I want to show you what, it, what its purpose was through a, through a few verses, all right? Look over in your Bible at Numbers chapter 20 and verse 28. Numbers 20 and 28. Numbers 20. Here it is up on the screen. You ready? Watch this. Oh, this is just an extra one here that I wanted you to see. That... Aaron was the first high priest, and you remember what happened when Moses and Aaron, they're leading the people, and, uh, and, and they come to, after, after nearly 40 years, they come to, 38 years it was, they come to the place of this rock, the people are thirsty, and God tells them to, uh, to speak to the rock, they don't speak to the rock, they strike the rock, you remember that? Strike the rock, water comes out, but God's mad. God said, uh-uh, see, y'all fronted, y'all showed off in front of the people, just for that, you guys are not going to the promised land. He says, Moses, you're going to die, and Aaron, you're going to die. You're going to die first, Aaron. He said, you're going to go to Mount Hor, and you're going to die there. He goes over to Mount Hor. He takes go, uh, Moses and him go up to Mount Hor. But when he gets to Mount Hor, now remember, he's the high priest, right? He's the high priest, and he has the high priest garments on. The high priest can't die until those garments are off of him. Now, this is Revelation. And what the Bible is like, what? Here, let's read it. Moses stripped Aaron of, if you read the whole chapter, you'll see that God's saying, you're done. You're finished. You're going to die. But he can't die with these clothes on. What it's showing us is if you understand these high priest garments, who you are as a result of knowing these garments, death won't be able to take you. Amen. Watch this. Look what it says. Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eliezer, Moses, Aaron's son. And Aaron died there on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eliezer came down from the mountain. He couldn't die until those priest, priestly garments were off of him. What is the Bible letting us know? You understand these priestly garments that you're, you're in Christ. See, this is what the Bible's talking about. We're in Christ. We're in, we're in him, in his garments. Now, Jesus doesn't have these clothes on sitting in heaven. It's showing us intrinsically what's going, it's showing us from an outward view through the scriptures what is intrinsically going on on the inside of Jesus. All right. So it's a picture of showing us what's on his heart. But we're in him as jewels. And as, as we get this revelation of how precious we are on his breastplate of righteousness, on his heart, connected to his strength, nothing will kill you. Amen. Many Christians die prematurely, I believe, because they don't understand these things. 
Say, thank God for destiny. I am so glad to hit the person next to you. Be real serious and say, I'm glad I'm in this church. Get a serious look on your face. Uh, this is really, this is great truth. All right. Now hit this next one. Let's hit this next one. Look at uh, Numbers 27, verse 18 through 21. Numbers 27. Good. You got to be on fire up there, dude. All right. Watch this. Joshua. Joshua is the, uh, the, uh, the one who takes over the children of Israel after Moses, right? Moses is going to die. I told y'all. God said, no, -uh, you ain't going in. And the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua. What is Joshua's name in the Hebrew? Yeshua. What is Yeshua? Jesus. Yes. Joshua is a picture of Jesus. All right. Take Joshua or Yeshua, Joshua, the son of Nun with you, a man in whom is, is the spirit and lay your hand on him. Telling God, God's telling Moses to do this. Set him before Eliezer, the priest and before all the congregation and inaugurate him in their sight. And you shall give some of your authority to him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. In other words, he's saying, I want you to inaugurate him in front of all the people so they can see that there is a shifting, a changing of the guard here. He's now in charge, but I want everybody to see this so that they don't act stupid when he's in charge. You get it? He says, and he shall stand before Eliezer, who Eliezer is the high priest now. He said, this leader shall stand before Eliezer, the high priest, who shall inquire before the Lord for him. Eliezer will inquire of the Lord for this leader. All right, the leader, Joshua. And the Lord, uh, for, by, him, by the judgment of the Urim, he will inquire of God by speaking to the Urim. Hmm, what's going on? At his word, at Eliezer's word, they shall go out, and at his word, they shall come in, and he and all the children of Israel with him, all the congregation. So all I wanted you to see in this, that they sought guidance. They were able to get guidance from the Lord by the Urim, the lights. What is, he, what is this a picture of? It's us, when we understand that we are the light of the world, that we are on God's heart, that's what's going to give us, uh, give us the heart to receive direction from God. Yeah. All right. If you didn't know that how close to God's heart you were, you would, you could, some people would not expect to get an answer from God. Whenever you ask God anything, if you don't get the answer today, you can rest assured he's going to let you know. Yeah. But see, if you know assuredly that, that you ask God, Lord, you know, I want to do the, this is or this or what about this and know that he's going to answer you. If you knew that he was going to answer you, but you didn't get an answer next week. If you know that and, and study that and rehearse that, speak that out of your mouth. God is going to ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. If you know that deep in your heart, you won't quit. Amen. All right. Uh, go to the next one for me. Go to the next one. Go to um, 1 Samuel. Right? 1 Samuel 23, verse 1 through 12. 1 Samuel 23. All right. Uh, yeah, watch this. Then they told David, look, this is King David. He's not king yet. Look, the Philistines are fighting against Caleb, and they are robbing the threshing floors. Next. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Caleb. But David's men said to David, look. We are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Caleb against the armies of the Philistines? He said, we scared just sitting here. <laughs> now, you got to know his army. He had this army of what they called depressed, uh, in debt, defeated. These were some jacked up guys who were hiding, and that's who David's first army of men was, three or 400 guys. So these guys are nervous guys, right? So David's like, yeah, let's go. He asked the Lord. The Lord said, yeah, go ahead and defeat him. But the guys who were, his army is like, uh, <laughs> not so fast, David. <laughs> we scared here. Why do you think we're going to go attack somebody? You got to be crazy. So they're not going. They're like, we ain't going. Watch this. Then David inquired of the Lord once again, and the Lord answered him and said, arise, go down to Cala, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. Next. And David and his men went to Cala and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and he took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Cala. All right. Sounds good so far. Now it happened when Abithar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Cala. There's no high priest at this time. Right. So this guy, Abithar, though, he's a priest, but he's not the high priest. There is none. 
that he went down with an ephod. He went down to David. Now it happened when Abathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Kela, that he went down with an ephod in his hand. What did he go with? This whole garment here and the breastplate, right? Because this is attached to it. An ephod in his hand. Next. And Saul was told that David had gone to Kayla. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand. Saul's getting excited. For he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Then Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Kayla to besiege David. Remember, Saul was chasing after David and uh, trying to kill him. And David and his men went down to kill David and his men. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Give me that ephod. David, at this time, there's no high priest, but David is a picture of the high priest. We see this at, uh, at, uh, when he went and fought Goliath. Remember what happened? The deal was, it, will you send out your best soldier, we'll send out our best soldier. Whoever wins, uh, whichever one of these guys wins, the, that army wins. Whoever loses, that army loses. So get the picture here. Think of how fearful they are. Here comes this little teenage boy. Little cute boy, right? Comes out and he says, why aren't y'all going to fight out there? And now they know God's sending them a deliverer, but they're expecting somebody big and strong. They really think it's going to be Saul, but Saul's terrified. So here comes this little boy. And now he's like, okay, I'll go get him. So they put on his arm, put his, Saul puts his armor on. He says, man, I can't wear that. I, I haven't proven that. He goes out there with a rock and a sling. Can you imagine the army of Israel? They're like, are you kidding me? Hold on, hold on. Let's think about this. If this dude loses, we die. As he goes, so we go. He's now stepped into the position of the high priest. But what he does is he says, this battle in mind, this battle is, G- is the Lord's. Are you with me? Okay. okay. Uh, your servant has certain. Okay. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, he's got, the, he's got the ephod. Now he's talking to the ephod, right? He's seeking the Lord by, by inquiring of the ephod. Your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Caleb and to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Caleb deliver me into his hand? Will this whole town now turn on me because they're terrified of Saul, right? And the army, because this is the Israel army, they're terrified of him. Will they turn on me even though I've just delivered them? And will they capture me and deliver me to Saul? Because Saul's the king, right? Well, they, he's saying this to the ephod. He's, uh, will the men of Caleb deliver me into Saul's hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Next. Then David said, will the men of Caleb deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. Yes. So he inquires and the, and the, and the Lord is speaking to him through the ephod. Now, I'll show you what this is all talking about. Hit the next passage for me. First Samuel chapter 30. First Samuel, Samuel chapter 30. You remember this? So, uh, David has his, 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 his army of three or 400 guys. They go down they, uh, and they're fighting the uh, um, Amalekites. They're fighting the Amalekites. While they're out fighting the Amalekites, someone else has come in and burnt down their, the Amalek, actually the Amalekites have come in and burned down their, their, their tents, stolen their wives and their children, all their stuff, jacked them up. They come back. The men are there. These guys now just coming back from war, come home. Their wives are gone. Their houses are burnt down. They're messed up. They're they're so mad. The Bible says they cry so hard, they can't cry any more tears. They're mad at David. They start picking up rocks, said, this dude is bad news. We're going to have to kill him. The army, David's own army now turns on him, right? Then David said to Abathar, the priest, <laughs> Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. This is not looking good. He's, he's nervous right now because his own army's turned on him, and he feels bad too. Come on, y'all get it? He's a leader, and everything's gone bad for him. He says, uh-oh, get the ephod. Get the ephod. I got to inquire of the Lord quickly, right? Please bring the ephod here to me, and Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them without fail, recover all. Jump down to verse 17. Then David attacked them from twilight until the evening the next day. Sun's getting ready to go down. From that day to 24 hours later, he's still fighting. Not a man of them escaped, except 400 young men who had rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites, who, the, ooh, there's so much detail in here. The Amalekites, Amal means to uh, grievous, tormenting, laborious work. 
The first battle of the children of Israel before they got to uh, Barna, Barna Kadesh Barnea, the lip of the promised land was the Amalekites. The Amalekites came to steal their rest. Rest means their confidence, their rest, and God was going to take care of them. That was their first battle. Well, these same Amalekites now are the ones who destroyed them, who, who had destroyed all their stuff. But now David has gone back. He's gone back and attacked them and killed them and took back, recovered all, rescued his two wives. Next. And nothing of theirs was lacking. Either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or, spoil or anything which they had taken from them, David recovered all. Why did David recover all? Because he understood the ephod. What it's saying is he was able to recover everything. Listen, saint of God. It's saying you recover everything that's been stolen from you by understanding the ephod. See, these are the secrets that I'm telling you about. Understanding what about the ephod? That I'm a jewel on God's heart. And I can ask him anything. And God says, go recover it all. Are y'all with me? Okay, let me show you this one. This is, this is the last verse right here, and then we're done. Here it is, last one. Yes, yes, yes. Turn to Ezra. Don't even turn to Ezra, because by the time you find Ezra, I'll be done. Put it up here on the screen. Just write it down. Ezra chapter 2, verse 61 through 63. Now, let me explain to you this story here. Are y'all getting this? Yes. Now, now, we haven't received our tithe and offering yet, so be sure uh, and get your seed and your tithe. You can start preparing it now, because we're getting ready to go. We're getting ready, getting ready to get up out of here. All right? All right, watch this. Let me explain this. The children of Israel um, in Ezra, in uh, Zechariah, in uh, um, another book, Ezra, Hezekiah, uh, a few of the books talk about this whole return of the children of Israel from the captivity of Babylon. It's a great history book. And, and so they remember in the book of Daniel, they, they had been run out of Israel, taken captive. But then this new king that had come in and said, hey, I read in the scriptures that, the, that there was going to be a king that comes along and they recapture their ground. He said, he's like, that's me. He had a heart for him and he sent him back. So they're going back to Israel, right? So they're going back to Israel, but now they need a genealogy sheet to see who's who. There's 12 tribes. And remember what had happened in the promised land. They were given certain properties and lands. The lands had been divided between the 12 tribes. And the Levites, the high priests, were, were the ones who were receiving the tithe from the people, right? The Levites were the now watch, who are the Levites? The Levites are the priesthood. The priesthood eat the best, they live the best. Guess who's the priesthood in the earth today? Not, not pastor, all, me included, but all of us are the priesthood. We're a royal priesthood. We should live on the best, eat the best, drive the best, enjoy the absolute best in life. So these people, as they're coming back to, to, back to Israel, they're saying, hey, we're, we're sons and daughters of the priest. They said, well, we don't see your name. In the genealogy, watch this. And the sons of the priest, here we go. And the sons of Habia, sons of Kaz, the sons of Bez Barzili or something, took a wife of the daughters of Barzili, of the Gideonites, and was called by their name. So they had a different name than some of the priests that were in the genealogy. You get it? These sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled. They weren't defiled, but because their names weren't listed on the priesthood, what it's trying to show us here is if you don't understand who you are as a priesthood and you, you don't, your identity as a priesthood isn't known, you, you miss out on something. Watch what happens. Hit the next verse. And the governor said to them that they should not eat of the most holy things till a priest could consult with the with the Urim and the Tumen to see if they are actually priests. It says that they should not eat of the most holy things. Let me tell you what the most holy things is today. Healing, abundance, blessing, favor. If you're not on, in the priesthood, you don't get to eat the best. But how do we know? How do we know? Consult the Urim and the Tumen. Go to the ephod. If they understand the ephod, now they, understand, they get to eat the holy things. Come on, y'all. Is that good? Close your Bible. I'm done. Y'all get that? 
Close your Bible. Father, we, we thank you. We thank you that we are kings and priests of the most high God, a royal priesthood, that we are perfect in your sight. Let's make some noise for the, for the high priest as he goes on out and gets his clothes changed. I know it's hot up there. Thank you. The priesthood never runs. Just walk, priest. Bless the people as you go. High priest, yes, yes. Blessings, blessings. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you that we are priests, that you are our high priest, our perfect, great high priest, and as you are, so are we. And as blessed as you are, so are we here in the earth. Lord, give us greater and greater revelation to understand the jewels that we, are, that we truly are in your heart and to see ourselves that way and to, and to uh, live on and in the most holy things, the, the greatest things here in the earth, to walk in all of your health, to walk in all the abundance, to walk in all that you have for us. To, to walk in the blessing of God in Jesus' name. Y'all got your seed, y'all got your tithe. Is that good news, y'all? Yeah. Come on, start playing, y'all.